Can two friends, Alice and Bob, communicate in public with eavesdroppers and nevertheless come to agree on a secret only they share? We'll see that this is possible through a procedure called Diffie-Hellman. So to analyze this, I've divided the situation up into three regimes. In the middle here, I've got the room. That's where Alice and Bob are actually communicating. That's public knowledge. Over here, I've got Alice's mind. That's just the stuff that Alice knows. And over here, I've got Bob's mind. That's just the stuff that Bob knows. So Alice and Bob will communicate in the, in the public space, in the room, and Alice and Bob will agree to start with the color yellow. Now, Alice will pick a secret color. Her secret color will be blue. And Bob will pick a secret color. His secret color will be red. Then Alice will mix the public color, yellow, with her secret color, blue, in order to get green. And she'll announce that color, green, to the room. Now, Bob already came up with his secret color, red. He'll mix the public color, yellow, with his secret color, red, in order to get orange. And he'll reveal orange to the room. Now, at this point, what do people know? Everybody in the room knows about yellow, about green, about orange, but only Alice knows her secret color blue, and only Bob knows his secret color red. Now, at this point, Alice heard Bob say orange, so Alice is going to take what Bob said, orange, and mix it in with her secret color blue in order to get a new secret color, brown, that well, only Alice knows. But what's Bob going to do? Bob heard Alice say green, and Bob will mix what Alice said, green, in with his secret color, red, in order to also get brown. And at this point, Alice and Bob agree on a secret. They both know the secret brown. Nobody in the room knows about brown. Only Alice and Bob know about brown. This is great. And really, from a certain point of view, it seems impossible that Alice and Bob were able to make this work. Alice and Bob are communicating publicly. They're not whispering to each other. Everything that they say is out in the open. And yet, even though they're communicating publicly, at the end of their public conversation, Alice and Bob end up having knowledge that only Alice and Bob have. Now, we told this story with paint and mixing colors. I'm going to recast this story with more numbers. Okay, so let's see that again. We're again going to start with the, the same structure. We've got the room where Alice and Bob are speaking publicly. We've got Alice's mind, stuff that only Alice knows. And we've got Bob's mind, stuff that only Bob knows. So we're going to do the same kind of argument, but instead of just with colors, we're going to use numbers. So Alice and Bob agree on a number two. And then Alice picks a random number, let's say it's 24, and Bob will pick his own random number, 17. And crucially, only Alice knows the number 24, and only Bob knows the number 17. Now we imagine that we've got a, a sort of a mixing function, M, which takes in two numbers and mixes them together somehow to produce a new number. So here, the room, the public knowledge, was this number two that Alice and Bob agreed on. And Alice had picked this random secret number 24, She'll mix the public knowledge two with her secret number 24. And let's suppose that after that mixing process is done, she gets the number 20. She'll announce that number 20 to the room. Bob's going to do the same kind of game. He had already picked that secret number 17 that only he knows. He'll mix it in with the public number two. And maybe that mixing function in this case will produce the number 21. He'll then take that number 21 and announce it to the room. Now, Alice heard Bob say 21. So Alice will take what Bob said and mix it in with her originally chosen secret number of 24. Let's say in this case that mixing process results in the number 25. Bob will do the complimentary thing. Bob heard Alice say 20, and Bob will mix the number 20 with his originally chosen number of 17. He'll also get 25. And at this moment, Alice and Bob agree on the shared secret. They both agree that their secret is 25 even though nobody in the room could deduce that their shared number was 25. Well, the key thing here is that if I mix with 24 and then with 17, I get the same thing as if I mixed with 17 and then with 24. I, mean, I really want something like this to hold in general, right? If I mix with A and then with B, that should be the same thing as mixing with B and then mixing with A. And that's a crucial property. Alice is taking the number that Bob revealed and mixing it with her secret number. Bob's taking the number Alice revealed and mixing it with his secret number. It's vitally important for them to both get the same number at the end, that mixing A and then B is the same as mixing in B and then A. 
But how do we find a function m with this property? Well, here's an example. We could just define our mixing function to be multiplication. And that's pretty good, because if I mix with a and then with b, well, that's 2 times a times b, which is the same thing as 2 times b times a, which means mixing with a and then with b is the same thing as mixing with b and then with a. But actually, this is a terrible choice of mixing function. Why is it such a bad choice? Well, it's because unmixing is possible. I mean, if, if Alice picks her secret number a and then reveals the result of mixing 2 with a, reveals x publicly to the room, then when the people in the room hear x, they can just divide in order to recover a. Right? One way to say this is that unmixing is possible. And you can't hide a secret, say, by mixing together paint if you can unmix the paint. We need a better technique. So Alice and Bob will publicly agree on a prime number p and a generator g. Then we'll define the mixing function, mxy, as being x to the yth power reduced modulo p. And this choice of mixing function has the key property that if we mix with a and then with b, that's the same thing as mixing with b and then with a. And, and the reason is because even if we're reducing mod p, g to the a to the bth power is the same thing as g to the b to the eighth power. The key feature, though, is this last condition that unlike the case of multiplication, where I can undo multiplication just by dividing, here, in order to undo this exponentiation, I would have to do a discrete logarithm. I'd have to be able to take logs modulo p. And there's no efficient method known for doing that. Now, one remaining question is which prime to agree on. Well, here's a prime number that Alice and Bob could agree on. 2 to the 1024th power minus 2 to the 960th power minus 1 plus 2 to the 64th power times the quantity, the floor of 2 to the 894th power times pi, plus 129,093. And this is an officially uh, provided prime number uh, for, for these purposes. I mean, if you look in some of the, you know, the closest thing the internet has to governance documents, these RFC documents, you'll see this prime number listed there. You might be wondering why pi is playing a role in this prime, this recommended prime number. Well, if you look at uh, this prime number in, let's say, hexadecimal, most of the digits of this number are actually hexadecimal digits of pi. And in this way, this is a nothing up my, well, I don't have sleeves, but it's, it's a nothing up my sleeve number, right? It's, it's a number that's, that's chosen to emphasize the fact that uh, the people choosing it it didn't rig the number somehow, right? They can't control the digits of pi, so they've got a number which is mostly digits they couldn't control. Even though this is a nothing up my sleeve number, it's probably not great that lots and lots of people are using this specific prime number for this algorithm. Take a look at this paper. L let me read a little bit of this paper to you. We estimate that even in the 1024-bit case, the computations are plausible given nation-state resources. A small number of fixed or standardized groups are used by millions of servers. Performing pre-computation for a single 1024-bit group would allow passive eavesdropping on 18% of popular HTTPS sites. So even if we can't do the unmixing in general, even if there's no general efficient solution to the discrete log problem, it's possible for a nation state, somebody with a lot of resources, to do a ton of pre-computation for a specific prime p and consequently massively speed up the discrete log problem for that particular prime. And that's potentially a threat to our ability to communicate secretly. Now, there's lots more to say about crypto, and we're going to get to more crypto in this course, but I hope you already appreciate how just a little bit of number theory can shine a tremendous amount of light on questions of how the internet works and how we're able to communicate secretly online.